的重量级的讲者，是贝莱德全球固定收益投资长及环球资产配置投资的团队主管 ，Rick Reader。Sure, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be in Taiwan. I have not, I've not been here. I think it's two or three years, but.、Uh... But I was told that I can go to my favorite restaurant in the world tonight, so I'm going to the Din Tai Fung. So I'm very excited,、uh, and I'm going to send a video to my daughters, or that's their favorite restaurant too, and they're going to be very jealous they're not here.、Uh, anyway, thank you for having me, and、uh, so I'll talk for a few minutes, talk about change in the world, investment in the world, and、uh, and then we're going to start with what did we know before we had this historic election? What do we need to know? And then we'll talk about what can we count on. To think about from a、uh, to invest from here, let's start with what do we、uh, what do we know now? First thing I'll say, and if you go back a month or so ago, a couple of months ago, people talked about U.S. economy going into a hard landing. All they talk about is soft landing, going to a hard landing. Economy goes into recession. It just it it happens after strong growth. You have to go into recession. I actually don't think the U.S. economy goes into recession anymore. I actually call it the satellite economy. I actually think the economy, just like a satellite, just keeps. It doesn't really land. It just keeps going. Every now and then, it needs a little bit of energy, but it doesn't really land. So I just want to show you some data around this. If you look at the upper left, U.S. economy in 2021 grew at almost 12 percent, and then in 2022 it grew at 8 percent. 23 it grew at 6 percent, and so we say, "Gosh, now we're going to go and we got a soft land." Actually, in the second and third quarter of this year, you had real growth—not just nominal growth. You had real growth of almost three percent, two consecutive quarters. And this will show you why I think this will continue, and why I think growth will continue. First one is if you look at the net worth—that red line in the U.S. net worth to disposable income has surged higher. A lot of this is money that was transferred from the government to the private sector, but you have tremendous amounts of money. That is out there that gets into consumption. People say the consumer is tired. If you look at that chart; that consumer is not tired. And if you look at the yellow line, that is your debt relative to your net worth. So what's happened post COVID? Consumer is actually delevered. Has a tremendous amount of money, no debt. Big deal. Why the consumer will continue? And then inflation has come down. And one thing I'm going to talk about later: we think inflation has come down, and it's no longer coming down. We think it's going to be pretty stable from here. We'll talk about how important that is for investments in a second. And then, and the、um, first speaker talked about this employment. People talk about, gosh, now we're going to see unemployment grow. If you look at it relative to history, and you look at what normally happens in a recession, that yellow line on the left, relative to where we are today, you're not seeing any pressure on employment. And in fact, this is what we call job losers, permanent job losers. You don't, you're not seeing that today. Economy is in good shape. First thing you need to know for equity investing: Do you have an economy that's going to operate at a solid level for a period of time? And, and my view is we're going to keep we'll keep the economy in good shape. One reason that I don't think people take into account: U.S. economy and and actually much of the developed world now is very different than it used to be. If you look at that chart on the upper left, U.S. economy is now a service economy, not a goods economy. And if you look at what happened from the 50s. Services grew, goods economy shrank. Big deal. By the way, the only time that red line, the only time you actually saw a pop in the goods economy was after COVID because people needed to go out and buy a car. Stuck in the house, got to go buy a car. But the goods economy has been declining. Why is this such a big deal? Look at the chart on the top middle. Goods economies, manufacturing, hard asset, financed, are very cyclical. China looks a lot like that. Very cyclical. You need stimulus. Look at a service economy in the upper right. So, what are services? Healthcare. What we spend on healthcare, education, telephone, cable, internet. It doesn't really change from month to month. The reason why this is such a big deal: in 75 years, you've only had two consecutive quarters of negative growth in a service economy after the pandemic and after the financial crisis. So, without some significant shock. Look at a cyclical economy, goods economy, left side. This is what the U.S. looks like now. It took a pandemic to send it into negative growth. Point being, big part of the foundation for anything about credit assets, yielding assets, equities, stable economy that will stay consistent. And now maybe you get a jolt of growth from a new administration 
which we'll uh, talk about in a second. By the way, I want to show you something that, that makes it even more clear. If you think about who the biggest stocks were over the last, what is that, five, six, seven decades, if you look in the 1960s, the big companies were General Motors, big car company, Exxon oil company, Ford Motor car company, all manufacturing companies. Look at what it is today. NVIDIA, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, Asset Light, don't need to be financed. This is a really big deal. Look at the bottom left. These companies are throwing off huge amounts of free cash flow. And so what happens is they can buy back their stock, they can invest in capital expenditure, R&D, very different equity market, very different economy. And I wanna show you one thing on the bottom right. Traditional companies borrow. And the way they finance their growth is they borrow, they use the debt markets. If you go back to the 90s, you look at those companies, about 29% of the companies in the 90s used, had debt as part of their balance sheet. Today they have no debt. So when the Fed raises interest rates, they actually make more money because they actually have cash on hand. It's something we've never seen in history. These big companies don't get hurt by interest rate. They don't slow down growth. They actually make, we manage money for some of these companies. They actually sit on a lot of cash. They actually make more money. The interest rate tool, so when people say, gosh, the Fed's raising interest rates, economy's gotta go into a recession. Actually not. Economy's not as interest rate sensitive. Uh, very, very different than anything we've seen in history. Stable economy. And then we've got this boost that Wei Li talked about. That is something that I saw. So with the Industrial Revolution, the spending is massive. If you look at this chart on the upper left, this is a spend on AI. U.S., obviously see China growing there. And then you look at the sheer private investments by geographic area. Mount the U.S.'s spending in uh, AI is pretty incredible. I did an interview with Sam Altman. I don't know if people, Sam Altman, he's talking about hundreds of billions of dollars that has to go in. And then, as Wei Li said, you've got to get into energy. And if you look at the bottom, these are estimates in 2022, 2023, what would be spent on manufacturing structures, data centers, cooling equipment required here. We're so far beyond what anybody expected. Battery technology, meaning you've got this big boost coming, and I think people underappreciate how big that'll be in the economy. Again, backdrop for the economy, and I'll talk about different equities in a second. You want to be invested alongside of these trends. You've never, I've, in my career, I've never seen that sort of growth paradigm. You want to be invested alongside of that. Let me throw out the one, uh, <laughs> one of the caveats, which I'll come back to in a second. Why did all this happen around consumption and some of this growth? There was a huge amount of debt put on the U.S. economy. The government put on to stimulate the economy post-COVID. But what it's done, I just want to show you one graph on the bottom left. There's now $211 trillion in net worth in the United States that has to be reinvested. There's not enough financial assets for the $211 trillion. Then you take this chart on the bottom middle, there's $9 trillion sitting in money market funds, just cash. And then there's on the, on the bottom right, if you look at, if you take cash and deposits, money market funds and deposits, there's $23 trillion. When people say stocks are gonna go down or they, they're, they're overvalued, by the way, I think the price is high. There's so much money that has to keep flowing into these asset classes. By the way, not just, in fact, I'll show you on the next page. Oh, I didn't put it in here. It's not just US, it's around the world, the amount of cash flow. So part of why, what I'm gonna talk about this later, Equities today, if you said the U.S. stock market or stock markets around the world, if you think of what's happening, you've got all that cash sitting on the sidelines and then people's earnings, certain percentage goes into equities. And those companies I talked, back, I talked about buy back a trillion dollars of their stock and there's no sellers of stocks because there's no supply, there's no new issue calendar. Pretty hard for these markets not to appreciate. So what do we know? Economy's in good shape, stable economy, not as interest rate sensitive, no matter what, massive investment in AI. I promise you, I've got, I know Elon Musk well. He will promote this uh, AI dynamic. Interest rates don't matter as much as they have. And again, the largest transfer of money from the public sector to the private sector we've ever seen. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that. So first thing I wanna mention, if you said one thing that I'd be careful about in the next couple of years, we manage a lot of assets, 
that they, you know, this transfer of money that went from the government to the private sector. Now you got a government that's got too much debt. You can see this on the upper left. That's the amount of debt. If you look at the second, this is the debt service because interest rates stay high. All that debt service is going to eat up all the potential fiscal spend. Um, if you look at the, the, the graph down next to it, that green line, that is the average cost of the debt. And I, I used to be the vice chairman of the borrowing committee for the U.S. Treasury. U.S. Treasury issues a lot of Treasury bills. What's happening now is our bills are maturing and we're replacing them with high coupon. So what happens is our debt service is going to eat up all the fiscal spend. You can see this on the upper right. I'll show you one last thing. And this is why I have, I'm a bit careful in the government markets. And I'll talk about why and where. China and Japan used to support a lot of the debt we issued. China used to own a trillion four of the U.S. Treasury debt. It's down to 800 billion and going lower. That number's going lower. China's not funding the U.S. going forward. U.S. has got this. You got to deal with the debt and you got to fund it domestically. And simultaneously, I won't go through all the charts, the spend in the U.S. is going up too much. So first thing that I got to be careful about the next year or so, this debt has to be dealt with. Too big. I've talked to a couple of people and maybe Secretary of the Treasury uh, about you got to do you got to deal with this. Uh, I've talked to the senior officials in the new government. You got to deal with this. This is something we got to watch really carefully. OK. And by the way, there's a couple of ways you deal with it. One thing I will say, the way we finance in markets today is the debt gets tranched. The way we finance real estate, the way we finance student loans, the way we finance everything gets tranched. I think the U.S. is going to spend, but we'll come up with a more sophisticated way, the way the capital markets actually borrow. And I think that's something you're going to see play out going forward. But really important in terms of how we deal with the debt. The, by the way, the credit markets are in incredible shape and allow the government to be sophisticated about how it finances going forward. Really big deal. Um, last thing I will say about what are we going to learn more about, and I just want to mention one thing and we'll talk about what, what areas you invest in relative to this. Inflation is not going down anymore. There's been a tremendous opportunity in interest rates that have come down over the last couple of years. But we think inflation, I can see this chart on the bottom left, inflation has come down into the low to mid twos. A lot of it is because goods inflation came down. It's a whole series, post-COVID, logistics, inventory management. We think inflation now stays pretty stable from here, maybe trends up a little bit alongside this AI spend. There's not a lot of money to be made in interest rates today. What we're doing in fixed income is we want income, income, income. Generate return using yielding assets, income, high yield, mortgages. We'll talk about this in a second. Don't worry about interest rates coming down and don't own the long end of the yield curve. And let, let's talk about this from an investment point of view. Where do we go going forward? Predicting the future is hard. Let's talk about investing relative to what we know. First thing, that chart on the top is where we were two months ago in the U.S. People expected hard landing. They expected the Fed to get the Fed funds rate down to 270 meaning the Fed was behind the curve, they had to move faster. It's now up to 4%. That is an incredible opportunity. We're trying to buy every two year, three year yielding asset we can because you can now buy it at 4%, meaning even if the Fed doesn't go again in easing, you've got a yield that is now pricing the Fed out. That is a huge change over the last month or two and it's presented a real opportunity and I'll show you why and where I think that's an opportunity. The flip side of it is, I don't know why people buy long bonds. I don't, I mean, I you know, run huge amounts of portfolios. If you look at the, at the top left, normally when your interest expense goes up or your interest payments go up, that's when rates tend to move higher. And all your volatility, you see this on the top right, is in the back end of the yield curve. You have a flat yield curve. There's no reason to own unless you're a life insurance company or pension in the U.S. because you have to own long bonds. There's no reason to own them today. And if you look at the upper left or the bottom left, the volatility in your portfolio comes from long treasuries. And if you look at this chart on the bottom right, the total return if you own 30-year treasuries is, this year has been negative 4.8%. The one to three year has been almost positive 4%. I think we're in an environment you just want to own the two to three to four year assets. Let somebody else have fun in the, with longer dated securities. They don't help your portfolio. They're not a hedge. If inflation's higher, they're going to hurt your portfolio. And I'll show you something. I've been doing this almost four decades. 
I don't remember in the, I don't remember ever <clears throat> seeing, seeing this phenomenon on the upper left. You can build a portfolio today in fixed income where your real rate of interest relative to inflation, if you assume inflation is two, two and a half percent, you could buy a whole myriad of fixed income assets at six, six and a half percent, build a portfolio that's stable with a lot of yield that covers your rate of inflation by 400 basis points. And I'll show you the summary of this in a second. By the way, this is just treasuries on the upper right, five-year treasuries. We haven't seen that. You can cover the rate of inflation. If you look at the bottom left, and look at the difference between if you own one-year paper, two-year paper, three-year paper, the yellow line is what it was the last couple of decades. You didn't cover the rate of inflation. Today, you don't have to go out the yield curve. You can build a, a, a very low-risk portfolio. US, Europe, and look at Asia. Investing in India, well, Asian emerging markets. India, Korea, your real rate of interest for a fixed, I call this the golden age of fixed income because I've never been able to do this before. Own two to three year, four year paper, cover your rate of interest, co cover inflation significantly. I call it the golden age of fixed income. And here's the portfolio. I run a series of portfolios where um, I'm trying to create six and a half percent yield. If you look at the upper left, so if you look at, and by the way, look how diversified it is and how high quality it is. So that's a low single A rated portfolio, low single A rated, and you're getting almost 7% yield. Using mortgages, AAA mortgages, three-year investment grade credit, uh, UK investment grade credit, European investment grade credit, AAA CLOs. If you look at the bottom, it's a 6.6% yield with only a 2.7% volatility. Today, running portfolios, I'd rather keep my volatility and fixed income down, keep my upside in equities, take my volatility in equities. And you can see this where I put the star on the upper right. If you own this type of portfolio, look at the green circle. Your range, even if you assume a one or standard, uh, two standard deviation return, you should make five to 9%, pretty darn stable, good fixed income portfolio. Let me finish on equities and then we'll put it all together. Upper left, and this is why it's been so powerful in equities these days, companies are throwing off 18.5% return on equity. You grow your book value, your stock, 18.5% with great margins. The only problem is the price to book or your price to earnings, you're pretty expensive. You're paying a lot for those earnings today, but something unique is happening. And I show on the top the multiples, but then I show the MAG-7 and how much they're spending today and how much revenue accrues to them. You can see it on the right. Look at the companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Meta. Their CapEx is going up 40%. Even though your multiple is too high, your earnings growth around that CapEx is super impressive. And as I said before, the technicals are the best I've ever seen ever because so much cash is outstanding. So I'd ride equities but I wouldn't keep my volatility in fixed income. I'd keep it in equities and I keep my upside in equities. Last thing, I have never said this. I haven't said this in 15 years. I'm buying gold. I haven't said that. I, I run uh, big portfolios. I'm buying gold and uh, I gotta be careful about how I describe this, but I also like Bitcoin. Why do I own both of them in my portfolios today? That, if you go back to that chart and talk about the debt in the world and the debt in the, in the US, if we can't keep rolling over the debt, what happens is you, you deteriorate reserve currency status and real assets do really well. I would buy, we could debate three to 5% of your portfolio, scarce assets, not just gold, not just Bitcoin or crypto, art, uh, real estate. This to me is a really big deal. And I've I haven't said this in 15 years. The only reason I like it today is because the debt presents a, uh, a risk to the system. So to finish, what are we doing? How are we managing money? How do we think about it today? That chart, you know, people talk about 60-40, they traditionally put 60% in equities, they put 40% in bonds. Look at that chart on the top left. If you said, I, I could buy the index, which is the aggregate index, what if I just bought one to three year parts of the index, government, corporate, I get all my yield just buying the one or three year because you get a flat yield curve. Keep your volatility down, clip a lot of coupon, earn a lot of yield in the front end. I'd still buy equities 
And, uh, you know, I show this chart on the top. I would use a bit more income in an equity portfolio, stable, and then I'd buy some private credit. And we could talk about private credit, which I think is a fantastic opportunity. And then I'd use some real assets. Different paradigm than I've, than I've seen in the past. So to summarize, economy in good shape, very good shape. Debt, we got to watch the debt. And that's part of why I like these real assets. The debt's pretty big in the US. We're going to see some modern finance utilize to try and grow AI, grow technology in the world. And I think it's going to be, I, you know, I've said it before, it's the most exciting period of investing I've, I've ever seen because we're going to see this surge of investment that's going to come in. Equity's going to do their job because of, uh, because of this amount of investment. Think about, depends on how old you are, where you are in life, how much you want to own equities, how much you want to own bonds, where in bonds and where in equities are going to make a really big deal. So. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you for sharing your insights.